Welcome to the IUN presentation, The Garden Sundial, More Than an Ornament. I'm Leslie Kaiser, Garden Coordinator and Moderator for this session. Our presenter this evening is Jessica Warren. She earned a Bachelor of Arts in Physics and Astronomy from Vassar College and a PhD in Astrophysics from Rutgers University, where she focused on X-ray spectra of supernova remnants. Since then, she has focused on teaching and is currently a lecturer in physics at Indiana University Northwest. Jessica loves sharing her interest in science, a trait cultivated in childhood growing up with a father who collected and invented sundials. She is active in science outreach, having judged for local science Olympiad competitions, hosted astronomy observing nights, and visited local schools. Jessica, we're excited to have you tonight. Thank you very much for having me uh, speak to you about sundials tonight. Um, sundials and gardens sort of go together. A lot of people, um, when they think of sort of a classic English garden or something, they picture a sundial in the middle among, um, amongst the flowers. Um, but a lot of people don't really understand um, how sundials work or that they work at all. Um, they think that they're just sort of garden decor. and. Um, I thought it'd be fun and uh, a little different for a talk on gardens to um, explain how sundials actually work and um, how they're connected to the motions of the, um, the earth and uh, the apparent motion of the sun in our sky. So um, just a brief outline here. I'm going to give a very brief history of sundials because, of course, um, <laughs> the history of sundials spans millennia, so we could spend a lot of time on that. Um, and then I'll explain why sundial time and clock time don't always match and why that is. And then I'll show you how to read a sundial and show you some other types of sundials. And then at the end, I'll talk briefly about um, planting a sundial. So um, the idea that you could use plants maybe to um, tell the time. So a sundial, as uh, most people know, is an ancient time-telling device, and it uses the sun to tell the time. And the history of um, using the sun to mark the passage of time is as old as humanity itself. Cultures all over the world have done this in various ways. Um, and this is an image of a stone circle in Northern Africa called Nabta Playa. And um, this is perhaps the oldest known astronomical um, uh, tool. Um, it's about 7,000 years old. And it's set up so that on the summer solstice, the sun shines through um, some of these stone alignments here. And so um, this would help the people at the time to know when the rainy season would be coming. And so they could then adjust their lifestyle accordingly. Um, it may have also had spiritual or religious significance, um, but clearly it was a major part of their uh, lives. Um, more commonly known is Stonehenge in England. And this is the same idea, these stone circles that are set up so that the sun on the solstices would pass through um, some of the, uh, the particular um, megaliths that are standing there. Um, and again, this would be like a spiritual or religious significance. Um, in North America, Native Americans also um, marked the passage of time with the sun. In this case, instead of a stone, stone circle, it was a wedge-shaped piece of rock. On the summer solstice, the sunbeam would um, appear on the spiral that's shown here. Um, and again, this may have had a spiritual significance. So clearly the sun um, plays a major role in cultures all over the world. And that has evolved um, and did evolve over time into marking not just the passage of time throughout the year, but the passage of time through the day. Um, and so these are two examples of um, sundials, one in Turkey and the other in uh, Pompeii, which you can still see if you visit uh, Pompeii. Um, uh, so these are about 2000 years old. Um, and these now show a little bit more um, maybe mathematical um, sophistication with the hour lines here and marking the passage of time over the course of a single day. Um, 
You could also mark the passage of time, um, not just for hours, but for other uh, significant um, moments. So this is um, a picture of an Islamic sundial in Tunisia, where the shadow lengths indicate uh, times for prayer um, throughout the day. So that would be another way to um, be connected to the sun and um, its motions. Um, as uh, time went on and uh, society became more global, um, back in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries, um, portable sundials were uh, found. And so these are uh, what are called diptych sundials because they actually fold, there's a hinge here. Um, and so you could carry it around. And this is, this is essentially the very first pocket watch um, where you could take it around and you would know what time it was no matter where you were. You wouldn't have to go to the, you know, the town sundial to find the time. Um, and then of course there are the traditional horizontal sundials. Um, this is one from California circa the 1700s. Um, and this is the type of sundial that when people think of sundials, that's the one they picture, this horizontal sundial with the stick um, coming up here at an angle. So this is the kind of sundial that I'm going to focus on um, to describe how to use it. So sundials tell time via the sun. So to understand how that actually works, we need to think about what is time. And I like this little comic strip. He says, I don't know, I invented the sundial, yelled something about being late for a meeting and ran off. Um, so this is just sort of showing that time is something that is really important to us as, as humans, as, as a society. Um, we think about time all, all the time, um, but we often don't think about where it came from or why we measure time as we do. And sundials are really, um, sort of getting back to the basics. They um, represent that initial human um, endeavor to mark the passage of the hours. So a sundial tells solar time. And what does that really mean? Well, solar time is the time elapsed since the sun has crossed your local meridian. Um, so what is a meridian? Well, that's an imaginary line that goes from the north through the zenith, which is the point directly over your head, wherever you are, and then coming due south. So it's an arc that, you know, you go outside and you measure where north is and bring your arm straight overhead to the zenith and then back directly behind you would be south. That would be your meridian. And when the sun rises in the east and comes across through the southern sky, it crosses that line. And the moment when it does so is solar noon. So the sundial is marking the time, the shadow of the sundial is showing how much time has elapsed either before solar noon or after solar noon. And that's called solar time. So that's what the sundial is actually telling us. Now, unfortunately for a lot of people, um, they think, well, sundials are telling the wrong time because they don't match my watch. Um, but that's not true. Sundials are telling the true time. It's your watch that has been adjusted. Um, and so why is that? Why does solar time not usually match your clock time? There's a couple of reasons. And we can start to understand this by just going back to our own experiences. Um, this is, these are two images of Camel Beach here at the Indiana Dunes. And um, one is clearly in wintertime and the other is from the summertime. And they're not the exact same place, but I just wanted to you know, remind you of how your own experience has shown you that solar time um, varies throughout the year, right? The sunlight changes over the course of the year. In winter, we have fewer sunlight hours, we have longer shadows, the sun is lower in the sky even uh, at noon, um, whereas in summer it's the opposite. You have the sun is very high in the sky, 
uh, you have long daylight hours, and you have shorter shadow lengths. So this is um, really showing that it's, it's the seasons that indicate to us that um, time is changing. Um, and again, you can think of that as different from clock time because you know six o'clock is dinner time in the summer and six o'clock is dinner time in the winter, but the sunlight is showing something very different. So clock time is sort of is very rigid in that respect, whereas the sunlight time is more um, variable. So why do we have the seasons? Why does the light change over the course of the year? The answer has to do with how the Earth orbits the sun. And the Earth orbits the sun in this little animation here. Um, it's tilted. See how the red and the green um, little rods are sticking out. That represents the North Pole and the South Pole of the Earth. And they're tilted with respect to the sun as uh, the Earth orbits. And it's really this tilt that gives us the seasons. The distance doesn't have anything to do with the seasons, um, which is something that a lot of people don't realize. So let me give you a still image so we can talk about it a little more easily. Uh, here in the summertime, the Northern hemisphere of the earth is tilted toward the sun. So if you imagine standing on you know, the earth here, um, and you're, you know, you're sticking out perpendicular to the surface of the earth. From your point of view, the sun appears very high in the sky. And as the earth spins on its axis, it will remain above the horizon for a long period of time. On the other hand, in December, when the earth's northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun, again, you standing right here, <coughs> excuse me, on the um, surface of the earth, you're going to view the sun as low in the sky and it won't stay above the horizon as long. Halfway in between, you have the autumnal and the vernal equinoxes, so the spring and the fall equinoxes, where the tilt of the earth is sort of sideways. So it's not tilted toward or away from the sun, it's, it's kind of face on. Um, and so you would have equal amounts of daylight and um, nighttime. So from your local perspective, shown here on the right, you can see that the sun will cross the meridian, that solar noon, at different places depending on the time of year. Um, and so on the summer solstice, that marks the point when the Earth's northern hemisphere is tilted the most toward the sun. And so that would be when the um, sun hits your uh, local meridian there. Um, and you can see that it would be at that point when the sun is highest in your sky over the course of the entire year. On the winter solstice, it's the opposite. It's the sun is lowest in the sky on the meridian over that entire year. And then halfway between at the equinoxes, you have midpoint. Um, so right away, we can see that the time between solar noon here um, is going to change a little bit depending on the time of year um, because the sun's position in the sky is not the same. In addition, the earth in its orbit is not a circular orbit. It's not a perfect circle. It moves in an elliptical orbit. Now an ellipse is basically a squashed circle. So um, it's the earth's um, orbit is just very slightly squashed, but it is squashed. Um, and this image is, or uh, illustration is um, not to scale. Um, but you can see that this illustration shows sort of a, an oval shape for the orbit. And what that means is the sun is actually not in the direct center of that shape. Instead, it's slightly off center. And so the earth is actually closer to the sun at one point in its orbit and farther at another point in its orbit. And again, this illustrates that distance doesn't give us seasons because we're closest to the sun in, um, in winter, in um, January 3rd, and then farthest in uh, July. So the Northern Hemisphere experiences um, winter due to, and summer due to the tilt and not the distance. But this elliptical orbit has another consequence. 
as the Earth is orbiting here, it's speeding up and slowing down because it's not a perfect circle. And so it's moving a little faster at perihelion when it's closer to the sun and a little bit slower at aphelion when it's farther from the sun. So this gives us a variable um, motion to what we perceive the sun doing in our sky. Therefore, the sun's position at noon each day will change because of the tilt of the earth and this elliptical orbit. Um, if you go outside and you um, go outside at the same time every day and you take a picture of where the sun is in the sky and you do this for out, throughout the whole year, you'll see that the sun actually traces out this sort of figure eight shape. And this is called an analemma. Um, and this could be a, you know, a fun thing to do. It takes a lot of patience, of course. Um, and if you're uh, uh, good at photography, this would certainly be a fun project. Um, but it, it's a neat thing to do um, you know, over time and, uh, and, and just to recognize and make that connection again that um, we are orbiting a star, that, that you know, um, we are connected to something outside of uh, our planet. But what this means is that the time between successive solar noons is not exactly 24 hours. Sometimes it's a little bit more, sometimes it's a little bit less. And of course, that would be extremely inconvenient for our global society if we had a varying length of day. Um, so um, clock time, or, or rather mean time, average time was introduced to give us the same length of day, the same time between successive noons, and that is 24 hours. But of course then that means that the sun time is going to be off from the mean time um, because uh, of these, uh, these two um, causes. So to reconcile solar time with average time, we have something called the equation of time. And I love, I love that term because, um, you know, if you think about, um, it just sounds so profound that you, you have mastered the equation of time. And so you have power over the secrets of the universe. Um, and it does seem a little intimidating, but it's actually a very simple and straightforward um, chart to use. So the equation of time is just the difference between solar time and that average time. So sometimes you have to add a few minutes to what you read on the dial. And sometimes you have to subtract a few minutes to what you read on the dial. And it just depends on where the earth is in its orbit um, as to which you have to do, whether you have to add or subtract. And you can see sometimes it's as much as 16 minutes here and other times it's actually zero. There's a few times of the year when uh, solar time and mean time do match up. Um, however, this gets us close to clock time. And for a very few people, this will be enough. This is, would be all they would have to do to convert from solar time to, um, to get clock time. But the reason why it doesn't work for everybody is because clock time, what we actually read on our watches, um, is not our local mean time. It's not our local average time. Our time that we read on the watch is defined by our time zone. So I'm here um, at IUN in Gary, Indiana, and that's at 87 degrees west longitude. So longitude lines are the lines that run north-south over the Earth. And the time zones are basically um, defined around particular longitude lines. So Eastern time is defined around the 75 degree longitude line. Central time where I am is at 90 degrees. So I'm a little bit off from that central time zone. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because my watch, and you know, someone who's living in the Quad Cities here in um, uh, Eastern Il Iowa, Western Illinois, we're gonna have the same time on our watch because we're all in the central time zone. 
But as the earth is spinning, I'm going to get sunrise first, right? The, the earth is, the, the sun is going to rise for me here because I'm east of Iowa. And then it will rise in Iowa a little bit later. So my local mean time is going to be a little different than the standard time zone time. So what this means for a sundial is that to get your sundial to read clock time, you also have to apply a longitude correction. And that's four minutes per degree that you're different from your meridian, your time zone meridian. So for example, I'm at 87 degrees west and the central time zone is at 90 degrees. So that's three degrees different. So three degrees times four minutes per degree gives me 12 minutes that I have to adjust my sundial time um, as well as the equation of time adjustment. But doing those two things will then match up your sundial time to your clock time. And it really is very straightforward once you get the hang of it. So um, now I want to describe for you how to read a sundial. Before we do that, I just wanna get some vocabulary down here. So obviously the shadow of the sundial is um, pretty obvious. Um, the flat part of the sundial that you read the shadow off of is called the face. And then the part that sticks up is the gnomon or the style of the sundial. The um, markings along the face are the hour lines, and they're usually represented with Roman numerals, um, but they don't have to be. Um, and these tell the um, time since or um, prior to solar noon. Um, and then the last uh, little bit here is that most sundials, um, or a lot of sundials, have a motto associated with them. This one is time flies or Tempest Fugit, which is a pretty cliche motto. But one of the fun things about um, it, making your own sundial or, or customizing a sundial is that you can come up with your own motto or find some uh, really clever ones, and there are plenty out there. So we have the basic vocabulary for a sundial. How do we read it? Why does it work? Well, let's imagine <coughs> we're at the North Pole. Um, so here is the North Pole sticking out, and we'll just, that'll be our gnomon. And we have the sundial plate, so it's flat on the surface, and then the gnomon sticks straight up. Now, we're doing this at the North Pole because the Earth is spinning around the North Pole. So it's very clear that as the Earth spins, um, the shadow or the sun is going to appear to move, and therefore the shadow will appear to move. It moves, uh, the sun moves 15 degrees every hour. And that's just, you know, 360 degrees in a circle divided by 24 hours per day gives you 15 degrees. So over the course of the day, as the earth is spinning, the shadow will trace out the hours and you will get all the hour lines marked out um, after 24 hours. Now, this is at the North Pole and we're not at the North Pole. So if we want to take this and move it down to our latitude, then we have to adjust the sundial. The gnomon sticks um, straight up parallel to the, um, to the axis, right? The spin axis of the earth. So the gnomon has to remain parallel. But from our point of view at mid latitudes here, that means that the gnomon appears at an angle. And then if we wanna take the face of the dial and make it flat at our latitude, we also have to um, angle that. So the face of the dial will no longer be perpendicular to the gnomon, it's gonna be at an angle. Um, and in fact, that angle between the gnomon and the face is equal to your latitude. So, um, you need to find a sundial that is specific to your location, or at least pretty close, uh, in order for the sundial itself to work and to show actual true time. Notice too that the hour lines here um, in this little uh, illustration are no longer evenly spaced. And that's because now the sundial's face is angled with respect to the gnomon. 
So the shadows aren't falling on a um, on a uh, perpendicular plate. Um, so therefore, uh, the hour lines are not evenly spaced, and that's something else you um, need to be aware of when you're looking at sundials. Okay, um, because the gnomon needs to point north, it needs to be parallel to the Earth's spin axis, we need to find north in order to set up our sundial. Um, so my favorite way, being an astronomer, is to look for the North Star. Uh, which is also called Polaris. And you can do this many ways. If you have an app on your phone, of course you can use that, but um, it's actually pretty straightforward to do without technology. As long as you can find the Big Dipper, which is a common constellation and one that most people can easily find. It's seven stars, they're very bright and they're gonna be in the Northern sky. They may be at different orientations. Like here in this um, illustration, it's sort of upside down. Here in this image on the left, it's right side up. So depending on the time of night or year that you're looking, it'll be differently oriented. But generally speaking, most people can find this with a little practice. Once you find the Big Dipper, you look to the end stars um, of the Big Dipper's bowl. And you follow those stars, line, like line them up and follow them out as though you're pouring out from the ladle of the Big Dipper. And so you follow these stars and the next brightish star that you come to is Polaris, the North Star, which is the very end of the constellation, the Little Dipper. So here on this image, here are the two end stars, the pointer stars, follow them to the next bright star and that's Polaris. Um, it's a common myth that Polaris is the brightest star in the sky. It's not, it's, it's a bright-ish star, but it is not the brightest by any means. Um, so uh, don't be confused there. You definitely need to find the Big Dipper and then use it to find Polaris. But the reason why it's called the North Star and why uh, we're using it here is because if we were to take the North Pole of the Earth and extend it straight out into space, it would basically hit Polaris. So it sort of marks where North is, where the North Pole of the Earth um, is from your location. So now we can get to how to actually read a sundial. You choose a sundial for your latitude. Your latitude and longitude are easily found nowadays uh, via Google Map. Just type in your address and it'll pop it up for you. You align your sundial so that the gnomon points to true north. And so, as I mentioned, you can find Polaris. You can also use a compass. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, then you read the sundial uh, off of the face of the sundial, look at the shadow's edge, um, and then adjust for the equation of time, adjust for your longitude. And then the last thing, which I didn't mention yet, is daylight saving. So that's an artificial, um, you know, human uh, um, adjustment that we make to our day. And so between March and November, we're in daylight saving. And so we have to add another hour to the sundial time. And that's it. Then you can read your sundial as though it were a clock. Um, so I'd like to show you this, and um, last week it was nice and sunny, although it was a little windy and chilly, but I recorded a video um, doing, reading an actual sundial and showing you the corrections. And it's a good thing I did, because I see it's raining outside right now. <laughs> um, so here I'm going to play this video for you. Okay, so to set up your sundial to read correctly, what you need to do is first go to the location where you're going to be um, setting up your sundial. Um, and so my sundial, these are um, sundials that were given to my children when they were born. So they're special and I like to keep them inside <laughs> so they don't get ruined by the weather. Um, but um, it, you go to your location where the sundial will be and then you um, look for true north. So true north can be found um, a couple ways. You can use a compass. Um, compass will point to magnetic north, and so you do have to be aware that um, true north is a little bit off from magnetic north. And um, you can find an app on your phone as well that will tell you uh, the deviation. Um, 
And compasses, you do also have to be careful of their quality. They don't always work very well, especially if you've got other um, devices nearby or something like that. But in general, it'll at least get you in the general direction. My preferred method for finding true north is to actually go out at nighttime and find the north star. So last night I came out and at this position, I looked for the north star in the sky and then sort of laid a stick down in that direction and then lined the stick with my sundial's gnomon today. So the gnomon is pointing due north. Now we can go and read the sundial. In the afternoon, we would read the shadow from the right edge. In the morning, we would read it from the left edge. And now we're in the afternoon, so we're gonna read this part of the shadow. So you can see here on the sundial's face, it has Roman numerals that mark the hours. And um, in between there are quarter marks, so 115, 130, 145, 2 o'clock here. This is the 1 o'clock mark. So we're coming up about 110, almost to 115. So our sundial is reading 110 p.m. Apologize, my marker is not very dark. Um, okay, that gives us solar time. But to convert that to clock time, what you would actually read on your watch or your phone, um, you need to make some corrections. The longitude correction um, is to get us sort of to the center of our time zone, because time zones are defined by a particular longitude line. Um, and my longitude correction is 12 minutes. I have to subtract 12 minutes from solar time. Um, and that's because I'm at 87 degrees west longitude and my time zone meridian is 90 degrees. That is gonna be the same all year round. The equation of time correction, though, changes based on <coughs> the position of the Earth in its orbit. And so that we have um, a graph for. Here we're in mid-May, and so reading up the graph, it says that we have to subtract about 12, or excuse me, about four minutes from the sundial. So the equation of time correction is four minutes. So in total, that's about 16 minutes that we have to take away. So that would bring us to 12.54. But we're also in daylight savings time. So we have to add back an hour um, because in daylight savings time, that uh, adds an hour to our regular uh, standard time. And so that would bring us then to 1.54. Okay, and then we can check it with the clock. There you go, 1.54 p.m. The sundial gave us our time. Okay, so thank you to my son, Adam, who helped me record that um, last week. Uh, so you can see that the sundial is actually quite accurate. It gives us the correct clock time once we know how to set it up and then how to make the adjustments for it. And again, once you set it up, you don't have to find north again. It's, it's already set as long as, you know, if you've got it permanently outside there. Um, and then you just have to make these uh, minor corrections. So I wanted to share with you some other types of sundials because the horizontal dial is not the only uh, sundial out there. Um, this is a horizontal sundial. It's uh, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Frankfort, Kentucky. Um, but it's a horizontal dial that shows some different information. Um, it's set up so that the instead of hour marks, there's basically one hour for every year of the Vietnam War. And the tip of the shadow falls on the name of the veteran on the date of their death. Um, and so this is a, it's just a very special and unique uh, memorial that uses the idea of sundials and the sun and the passage of time to um, commemorate these veterans in a, in a really unique way. Um, Sundials can also be um, mounted vertically, so they can be on walls. This is a sundial in uh, uh, Bloomington, on Indiana University of Bloomington. Um, and it's the same idea. You still have a gnomon coming out um, that casts a shadow and hour lines marking the, um, the hours from solar noon. And so same adjustments that you would make. Um, another type of sundial here is an armillary sphere. So this is one in, uh, at Purdue University, Fort Wayne, Indiana. 
And notice here that um, this is a little different because the face of the gnomon is actually curved. This ring here, you can see the Roman numerals that mark the hours. And that's really what you are reading the time off of. So the arrow here is um, the gnomon and you're reading the shadow of the uh, arrow here um, gives you the, the time. So um, that's a, a little different. This is a type of equatorial sundial and perhaps a more famous uh, equatorial sundial is the one in front of the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Um, and so if you get a chance to visit it, I, I recommend it. The Adler Planetarium is great as well. It has all things astronomy as well as sundials. They have a large collection of historical scientific instruments. Um, and so this is right outside um, in front of the Chicago skyline. And then, um, there's another type of sundial called an analematic sundial. And this is one in uh, Kokomo, Indiana um, at a library. I believe it's a public library. Um, and this type of sundial, you'll notice, has no gnomon. Um, there's nothing sticking up out of the ground. It's just painted on the, um, the pavement here. And that's because the gnomon for an analematic sundial actually has to move. It's not uh, stationary like it is for these other ones that I've shown you. So here you'll see the months um, labeled. And this is kind of cool because it's an interactive sundial. You actually become the gnomon because you're standing perpendicular to the ground. So you go and you stand on the date um, that you're visiting and your shadow then will fall on the hour line to give the time. Um, and so that's kind of a, a cool, uh, different type of sundial that um, you can find at various places. A lot of museums uh, tend to have these because they are uh, pretty neat and interactive. Um, I would highly recommend that you check out the sundial registry at uh, sundials.org. So that's the North American Sundial Society website. And their registry um, has for every state as well as provinces in Canada and I believe Mexico, um, a, a list of sundials and images and something about them where they can be found. Um, so it might be fun, you know, if you're bored over the summer or something, you wanna take a little road trip, find some of the sundials that are near you and go and visit them. Um, there's, a, there's a lot that you'd be surprised. Um, so that's a, a fun um, adventure you could try. Um, if you're interested in finding or buying a sundial, um, the North American Sundial Society also has uh, links to um, artisans that make sundials. And the nice thing about those is that they are um, personalized. You can have them made for your exact location. Um, you can also have uh, your own different images put on them, a special date commemorated, your own motto, for example. Um, so, you know, that's kind of a fun thing to do if, um, if you're interested. If you um, want to buy a sundial at a garden store or some other specialty store, um, then you can do that too. But I would recommend taking along this template to make sure that it is you know, at least close to accurate for your location. But you can also do this, you can make a very um, cheap and easy sundial through this. Um, so this is a great place. Um, again, the Sundial Society website, go to Teacher's Corner and draw a sundial. You can input your latitude which I've done here and you click draw and then it'll show you, um, it, it'll print out a template essentially that you can then print out and paste onto a, you know, an old cereal box or some sort of thin cardboard um, and make your own sundial. Or you could use it as a template if you're handy and you wanna you know, make your own sundial on uh, plywood or, or uh, something like that. Um, you can do it for your exact location. Um, and then I would, as I said, recommend taking your template with you to a garden store um, to make sure that the sundial that you're interested in is accurate for your latitude and that they actually do have the hour lines, you know, approximately close to um, appropriate. Um, you know, if it's not exact, if it's 40 degrees and your latitude is 42, you know, it, then you may not be, um, you're not going to get to the minute perhaps uh, for your sundial time, but you'll get close and, um, and that could be enough. Because this is a, a garden talk, I also wanted to mention um, this idea of a sundial plant. So um, Carl Linnaeus was a Swedish botanist in uh, uh, the 1700s 
who had this idea of uh, planting an orologium florae or flower clock. And so um, if you're a gardener, then I'm sure you've noticed that um, certain flowers will open or close their petals at certain times of the day. And so Linnaeus had this idea that you could plant these different types of flowers um, that you could then use to tell the time. If you see, oh, the morning glory's petals are open, then you know it's you know eight o'clock in the morning or something like that. Um, this, of course, is dependent, you know, the types of plants that you would need are dependent on your own location, your climate, your soil, um, et cetera. But it's another connection to the sun and to the fact that the sun really has this impact on us um, beyond just, you know, giving us light. Um, so I did some research. I, I'm not a botanist, but um, I did some research to um, see what types of plants you might use. And um, so here are a few examples. And I have links to the articles that I found um, that Amanda um, can share. So um, in the morning, you might uh, have the morning glory will open its petals. Later in the morning, um, hibiscus. Uh, early afternoon is the Sparamanthus terricifolius. Um, late afternoon, the appropriately named four o'clock. Uh, in the evening, you would have the evening primrose open, and then maybe even at night, you would have a moonflower. Um, so this would be kind of a cool thing to do, to have a, an actual sundial in the middle, and then your plant sundial around. Um, and then, you know, that would give you that connection, that extra connection between um, nature and the sun and our daily lives, how time really runs our lives in a lot of ways. So um, to conclude here, I just want to um, express how sundials really connect us. They're, they represent um, a connection between mathematics. We have this equation of time and, and the hour lines planned out, uh, the angles. Um, they connect us with history through um, the millennia, the different types of sundials, how they've been used, um, and the fact that the sun, you know, and its passage of time is as old as, as humanity. They connect us with astronomy. It's the motion of the earth around the sun that gives us these shadows, that gives us the seasons, that, um, that allows us to tell time in the way that we do. Um, and they connect us with art. I, I've, I've shown you just a few examples of many types of sundials that are very beautiful and can be quite um, lovely sculptures and, and pieces of art in addition to scientific instruments. And they connect us to nature. By definition, you have to be outside to read a sundial. You have to be in nature and connected to the sun, pay attention to the weather. Um, and they're often found in gardens. And so that brings that connection um, to us. So hopefully this um, talk has shown you that sundials are much more than just simple garden ornaments. I have a, a list of resources here and also my email. And so I wanna give a special thanks to the North American Sundial Society president, Fred Sawyer, who also happens to be my father <laughs> um, for uh, suggestions and resources as well. And thank you, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, our first questions come in. Are permanently installed sundials typically positioned correctly? That's a great question. <laughs> um, it depends. Um, most places like universities, um, museums, um, libraries, they tend to have their permanently installed sundials correct because uh, they're academically, you know, inclined, and so um, they often will get um, consultants or they have somebody in house that knows how to do it. So yeah, those are generally, um, generally speaking, uh, um, appropriately oriented. But you know, you could, you know, test it out. You could always go at yourself and uh, with these tools that I've given you here and um, see <laughs> for yourself. Okay, our next question, how does the sundial work with the library books and flower? I don't see where it would make a shadow, the art example. So you're right, there is no um, shadow here um, or, or no nomen. And that's because um, this sundial requires um, a person to be the nomen. So you actually have to go and stand on 
this line here, see the red and the green line, and you see the um, dates or the months marked out. So let's say we're in May, so that's right up here. So we would have to go and actually put our feet right here on May, and then our shadow would fall on these flowers, you know, somewhere, depending on the time of day, and that would is what we would read then um, to give us the time. So this is an interactive sundial. You have to actually be the gnomon in order to um, read the sundial, which makes it unique, special. And, and this, this um, artwork is certainly unique to this sundial, but this type of sundial is found in other places as well. Um, I know the Kalamazoo Valley Museum in Kalamazoo, Michigan also has um, a, a sundial like this, where you have to be the gnomon. It has to be your shadow. Um, so those are kind of fun to, to go and explore. Thank you everyone so much for taking the time to join us today. And thank you very much to Jessica for sharing this wonderful information with us today. Thank you.